1 Corinthians chapter number 16, we'll begin reading in verse number 13. Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, be strong. Let all your things be done with charity. I beseech ye, brethren, you know the house of Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of Acacia, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. That ye submit yourselves unto such, and every one that helpeth with us, and laboreth. I am glad of the coming of Stephanus, and Fortunatus, and Achaicus, for that which was lacking on your part they have supplied. For they have refreshed my spirit and yours, therefore acknowledge ye them that are such. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you again for the opportunity to preach your word. Lord, I pray that you'd hide me behind the cross tonight, Lord. Lord, you know I stand where no man can stand on his own. Lord, I pray that you put a edge around my mind, a bit about my tongue tonight, Lord. And Lord, I just pray that uh, you'd give me an extra portion of the Holy Ghost to give to your people, Lord, and to give unto them as you've given unto me. And Lord, I pray you'd do the work tonight and get all the glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, by way of introduction, first I want you to notice the exhortation in verse number 13. The Apostle Paul writes, Watch ye. Why do we watch? Because there's something, one, trying to get in, and two, we're supposed to be watching for those that need to have the gospel go out unto them. Right? We're supposed to stand in the, the gap, make up the hedge, so that Satan doesn't work his way into the church. We're supposed to avoid giving Satan, one, give not place to the devil, but also not to open up wedges that he can drive a divide even further into. But also, we're supposed to watch, because we are, as we heard about this morning, to go under the whole world. Right? If we're not watching for those that need it, that the Lord burdens our heart for, I don't know if this has ever happened to you guys, you ever just be looking around, as I call it, people watching? Most of the time I'm looking and thinking, man, what in the world is that? Right? That belongs at a zoo. Right? But then you'll see someone, and then God will just say, go up and talk to them. If you're not watching, the Spirit can't direct you. You could sit at a red light all day long, but unless you're watching for green, you're not going anywhere. Watch ye. Stand fast. What's that? Equip yourself. You cannot stand on your own. We're on the rock, right? He's planted us on the rock. We're not moving salvation-wise. But when it comes to spirituality, stand fast. That means hold out against all pressure. It means don't give any ground. Nowhere in the Bible do you find that the church retreats. It always marches forward. Can't do that if you're not willing to first stand and keep that which God's blessed you with. That which God has arranged in your life to where you have grown to the point of spirituality where you're at and can continue to grow. You'll never continue to grow if you're not already grateful for, standing fast, sticking by the stuff, so to speak, that God's already given you. But then, quit you like men, be strong. Right Now this is not a dig at women, but when you think of a manly man like Paul Bunyan, right, guy that you know, was so big that he got his own big blue ox for some reason. Never understood that. But... Right, you think of John Henry, the man who raced the machine on who could drive the rail piles, you know, quicker. Right? You look at men that faced adversity, you know, he looks a little dorky, right? And he didn't look like he did in the movie. But Moody, movies like Rudy, right? Based on a true story. Why do people like Rudy? Because he quit like a man. He got his butt kicked for four years. But after that, right, after painting helmets for one year, because he had to go to JUCO before he could get into Notre Dame. Then after getting pummeled for three years in the last game, right, he goes out there, didn't do anything all that spectacular. He just did his job. That's what they expected him to do. He didn't do anything above and beyond. But all the seniors went in and said, hey, he's playing. After all that time, all that effort, he never quit. Right? You quit when the job's done. That's what that verse means. Quit you like men. In other words, be courageous. Right? Not just standing, but standing because you know what you're standing for. Nothing can move you. Be steadfast, unmovable, as it's written. Right? Planted like a tree by the waters that shall not be moved. Our roots dig too deep 
in order to quit when the wind blows a little bit. Now we may bend, but our feet are always standing. Right? My flesh may fail me, but it doesn't throw the clay away. Right? As long as I'm standing, rooted where I was, I may get knocked over, but that may just be the time that the Lord steps in and says, I got this. Right? I'm not going to give up. You've got to take me out of the fight in order to get me to quit. That's what that verse means. Then, verse number 14, let all things be done with charity. Now, what is charity? That's for the betterment of others through love. You can tell somebody you love them all day long. But charity is when love gets feet added onto it. That's when you do not expecting. That's when you do without a repayment plan. Right? That's where you know, you're not even interested in recouping what you gave out, let alone interest. Right? You're doing because you know it's better for them to have it, that you don't deserve it because God blessed you with it and you're not worth the powder it takes to blow away. And because you love someone else, you do it out of charity. A charitable act is one that doesn't bring attention to the one that does it, doesn't ashame or make an example out of the one that receives it, and it exhorts and glorifies the one that orchestrated it. That's God. Charity is not about you and it's not about the person you're giving it to. It's about God getting the glory for it. Because I love you because He first loved me. The only reason I can help you out is because God saw fit to put me in a position where I could. That's charity. Right? And if we're honest, a lot of people give to charity nowadays because they want to get it on a tax write-off. Right? If it's really charity, you may turn it in, but the government may be the only people that ever find out about it. Right? You're not interested in recouping. You just want to do because you love. Right? And I'm not just talking about money. I'm talking about time. I'm talking about lending an ear. I'm talking about being a shoulder. Someone that will bear up one another when they're weak. Not expecting, well, when I'm, I'm going to call you, you owe me one. No, no, no. Because all the times that Christ lifted me up or sent somebody by my way, that's why I will, out of charity, help bear your load for a while. Right Then, verse number 15, I beseech you, brethren, notice the example. You know the house of Stephanus, that it is the first fruit of Acacia. Well, what's Acacia? That's the area that Corinth was around. Right? Call that the greater Cincinnati area, and Corinth was in it. Okay? Just like Florence is in greater Cincinnati. But out of all the area, the first person got saved, Stephanus. Right? And instead of tucking tail and turning, when times got rough, what's it say? He was the first fruits of Acacia, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. Now, I've seen some people that got involved, I've seen very few people that get addicted. I've seen some people who made a commitment, but then their craving went away. I've seen some, you know, catch on fire out of zeal, but there's no fuel in the gas tank to keep them going. And then I've seen others that it doesn't matter how much gas they've got in the tank, they're addicted. They just can't get enough. Now, he's not here, so I'll talk about it. You can't convince me Brother Phil ain't addicted to Jesus. Right? He's in his own world, but he don't even know what he says sometimes when he's shouting. He's just back there enjoying himself, having a time. And he doesn't care what anybody else thinks. Right? But why does... Because he loves the fact that God gave him something to do. And instead of treating it like a burden, he became addicted to it. Now it's the joy of his life. You know what set Stephanus apart from some of the others that might have got saved in Acacia? is that Stephanus, instead of saying, well, okay, here's the life that I had, and I'm going to try and figure out how to get God to fit into all this. No, no, no. Junk all that. Just give me Him. Everything I am, everything I have is His. He addicted Himself not to a position, not to become an apostle or a disciple. What's it say? To the ministry of the saints. He's worried about other people. Right? The ministry is ministering to people. He didn't hold the fact that he was the first one that got saved over anybody else's head. 
Instead, when he saw somebody that was going through something, he came up to him and said, I've been there. And it may not help you, but God sent me by your way. This is what helped me. I'm going to tell you about it while I unload you from what burden you're carrying, and I'm going to bear it for you for a while. And then at the end of a mile, I'm going to go another mile with you just so that you can get a little extra space of grace where maybe your legs can regain their strength to where you just need a moment. He was concerned with people, not positions, not recognition. But see, even though he didn't want it, everybody knew about Stephanus. What did the Apostle Paul say? Ye know the house of Stephanus. He says, they didn't want the acclaim. They didn't want the recognition, but God's made an example out of them. You know how they are smack dab in the middle of God's will and crazy about it. They're in hog heaven. And everybody knew it. Not just in Corinth, in all of Acacia. Everybody knew that boy, some of them might have thought he was crazy. Some of them might have thought he was a heretic. Some of them may have just ignored him, but everybody knew that boy was out doing something for Jesus. And not just him, his whole house. If you get addicted, those around you might just get addicted. But anyway, I want you to notice the edification, or the building up. In verse number 17, I am glad for the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaicus, for that which was lacking on your part, they have supplied. Well, what was that? I don't know. The Apostle Paul didn't go into it. But what they were lacking, God used those men to provide. They met the need. They built up those that were young in the faith, this young church in Corinth. When they had need, God sent those boys by with the answer. They were praying, Lord, let me do something for you. When God said they need something, they provided it. Do you understand what that means? What was lacking on your part? They would have gone without if not for them boys. Edification is not always just encouraging somebody. In order to build up, sometimes you've got to put some brick and mortar down. Sometimes you've got to go in, Brother Ray, and replaster some walls. Maybe take out some old drywall and hang some new drywall. Right? And trust me, when he put it in the basement, sheetrock ain't fun. Right? And it's less fun when you're doing it by yourself, I'm sure. Right? When you're trying to hold it and screw, you know, drill it into... But these boys never complained. They didn't look at him and say, well, nobody ever gave us anything. No, no, no. They said, God's been so good to us, of course we want to help them out. And because it was out of charity, they gave to others, I'm convinced, even if it meant that they themselves would have gone without. When was the last time that in order to edify somebody else, we went without a night of sleep? When was the last time that we got so serious and burdened about something that we gave up a meal just to show God how serious we were about it? When was the last time that we purposed, Lord, I've cleared everything, and I'm not moving until I get an answer from your word. You say, well, what happens in those situations? Well, Hannah was a woman that got so serious with God in the temple of God that the high priest thought she was drunk. He tried to kick her out and said, you know, you're defiling the house of God. But she was so heartbroken, everybody else thought she was nuts. But she got so serious that God raised up one of the greatest men of God ever lived. Right? Couldn't have a child. God gave her one. And she didn't want a child for her honor. She said, Lord, if you give me the desire of my heart, I'll give them back to you. She said, I want to be a blessing, not to others, not to myself. I want to bless God with the fact that he gave me a son that can be used for his honor and glory. I want to give back something that God, to that point, hadn't given her. She said, I don't want it selfishly. I want it so that you can get honor out of my life. But then... I want you to notice the encouragement in verse number 18. For they have refreshed my spirit and yours. Therefore acknowledge them that are such. Last part of that, he's saying give credit where credit's due. Right? We know that the man of God's worthy of double honor. But sometimes we forget that those that work behind the scenes, those things that are done in secret that God rewards openly, 
Sometimes we forget to give credit where credit is due. But it's very easy to receive help, but it's very humbling to go back to that person and say, you were the reason that I made it through this. God used you to orchestrate something in my life. This is the Apostle Paul we're talking about. Outside of Jesus and John the Baptist, maybe the greatest preacher that ever lived, maybe the most spiritual person that ever lived, because Jesus said, no man born a woman is greater than John the Baptist. Right, so that puts him in third. But that man said, for they have refreshed my spirit. The man who was walking down the road to Damascus and saw Jesus was refreshed because some people just out of charity wanted to go and give unreserved, unselfishly for the honor, for the glory, for the praise and worship of God. And he's saying, trust me, I know if they encourage me, they can encourage y'all. I mean, Brother Josh said it this morning, he was the chiefest of sinners. That's what the Apostle Paul wrote. In other words, he's saying, if they can help this old boy out, I got a lot of problems, and if they can help any of my problems, they can help any of your problems. He's saying, I wrestle with the flesh more than anybody. That's what he was saying. Now he's saying, and if my time of weakness, if they can help me, I guarantee you they can help you. Right, but also, when it says that they've refreshed my spirit and yours, if you go to the end of your chapter there, there should be a paragraph that says the first epistle to the Corinthians was written from Philippi by Stephanus, Fortunatus, Acha Achaicus, and Timotheus. Well, Timothy, that's first and second Timothy, same guy. But each one of the men that the Apostle Paul mentioned that had been a refreshment to their soul he's saying receive them as my co-laborers my co-workers in the ministry of God because they've refreshed me and I know they're going to refresh you who do you think preached what the Apostle Paul wrote to them? these three boys and Timothy they delivered the very words of God to a church that was waiting on what God was going to send next they didn't have this. they still waiting. They may have gotten a piece here and a piece there from what the Apostle Paul preached somewhere else or he may have sent Timothy by. Right? But God orchestrated it that these men were the very hands that were used to write down the words that the Apostle Paul gave or were given to the Apostle Paul by God. And they pinned down the very words that would be refreshing under that church. And then they got to be the deliverers of that word now, talk about being honored being blessed of God to take something that would endure thousands of years later the very words of God given to somebody because do you realize that God can use you in the Bible that you've put in you like brother Lucas if you're faithful to memorize it and put it in you God can bring that out of you and use you just like he did Stephanus and Fortunatus, and Achaicus, and Timothy, that we are written epistles known and read of all men, but if somebody don't know the Bible, God can bring the Bible out of you to work on that person, to encourage that person, maybe to just remind that person what they already knew. But because of life, it had slipped from the forefront of their mind. You know what? You're right. You say, what are you getting at? These men literally brought the word of God to other people. You may be the light, the salt, and the word that Jesus sends to somebody else. So imagine what we lose out on, what they lose out on, if we don't do it in charity. If we don't do it so that we can, you know, hang it over somebody's head, so that we can try and get buddy-buddy with somebody else. These men left everything, went all the way to... Philippi, either in shifts or all together, got what the man of God wanted to send back to Corinth, bring it back, and they say, here, this is what God wants you to have. It wasn't about them. They were selfless. And because they got rid of themselves, they were filled with God. 
But we're not going to teach on most of that or preach. I'm used to saying teach because it's Sunday school. But in verse number 13, watch ye stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men, be strong. Let all your things be done in charity. And then he talks about three men. That one, that which was lacking on your part, they have supplied. And then later, it says, For they have refreshed my spirit and yours. And when we know that we're supposed to stand fast, that we're supposed to watch, that we're supposed to quit like men, there are weeks, there are days, there are months, sometimes there are years, that your whole apple cart gets turned upside down and it's all you can do to hold on. I see in verse number 13 and verse number 14, because verse number 13 is what we're supposed to do. Verse 14 is how we're supposed to do it. And if we let life get in the way, not only will we not do it, but if we do attempt to do it, we're doing it out of the wrong motivations. Not doing it out of charity. Not doing it out of love. Not doing it out of compassion. Some having compassion, making a difference, Brother Josh talked about this morning. Instead of doing it that way, we'll do it just to check the boxes, to tick off things on the list. I see in verse 13 and verse number 14 the danger, if you will, of depression. He said, what are you talking about? Well, if you look up depression in Webster's 1828 Dictionary, you will find that one of the definitions when it's talking about mental depression is a desire or a need for courage and animation or energy. A state of sadness. You know what depression is? Depression's when you get up and go, got up and left a long time ago, and you've got no motivation. It comes upon you suddenly. Now you can go back and you can track it. There's going to be a whole bunch of things that were on the camel's back, but there's something, there was a straw that broke that camel's back. And that's when you become aware of it. And in hindsight, you could turn around and say, yeah, Lord, I see you right there. Sign. Sign here, sign there. But what's the good news? The good news is that the perfection of the church is that God has already equipped us to handle many of the things that we're going to face. Not just when we get low, but when we get so low, we don't know how to get up. Now, you're going to tell me after four weeks of meetings, over two months of great services around here, anybody around here just had a couple of mornings where you want to get up out of bed, but you got no motivation to? Right, that your feet touch the floor, and you're thinking, what in the world am I even doing? Right, let's be honest. Okay, let's get personal. I've mentioned this in the teens class before. But I am one month away from being 28. At the age of 17, I was diagnosed with clinical depression. For those of you that don't know what that is, that's I got a chemical imbalance up in my head. At the time, Brother Brian, I was lifting weights all the time. Haven't done that in a while. But at the time, lifting weights all the time, testosterone went up through the roof. And there's this thing in your brain called serotonin, which levels out the testosterone so you're not all roid rage all the time. And if your brain don't make enough serotonin for the testosterone, then you roid rage all the time. It eats up all the serotonin, and what is it? That's a curse of sin. Right? But on and off. I've been on medication to regulate that. Because if not, I get, it's very easy in those moments to get angry and to sin. Right? Because I am not, sometimes it doesn't even occur to me that I just flew off the handle. You say, how can that happen? We're fearfully and wonderfully made. Right? I, I can't figure it out. People have been studying humans for thousands of years. They still can't figure us out. Do you know that nobody knows why people need to sleep other than the fact that we get tired? Your body's not doing anything while you're sleeping that it can't do while you're awake. You just get tired. You know what I think? It is? God made us that... You know, we know somewhere deep down in our soul, in the back of our mind, there's a time and a place for rest. Right? That labor's all in good, but you also need to 
tend to your own vineyard. Right? As the Shunammite maid said over in the Song of Solomon, I've kept others' vineyards, but I have not kept my own. I'm guilty of that. Right? Believe it or not, I actually do have a heart. Right? Every now and then, I do try to help people. Right? And I get so caught up in trying to do for others that I neglect self. Right? Revival going on. I'd say, hey, I want to get in. Right? Had, but where'd all this come from? Well, about a week and a half ago, it hit me again. Out of left field. Don't know what broke the camel's back. Probably stress. Usually stress in my situation. Because when I get stressed, it's because I want to do one thing and everything else in the world is trying to keep me from doing that one thing. And then that stress just builds up and then the whole steam engine blows. Right, that's me. I don't know about you. But I do know we all got them moments. Right? Am I saying everybody needs to be on medication? No, I'm just telling you what's going on with me. But there's going to be moments. Here, let's just be real honest. There have been moments the only time that I've felt like I was actually alive is when I was up here teaching Sunday school. Rest of the week, just feel numb. Hollowed out on the inside. I'm just going through the motions. I'm sitting down and reading... And I'm reading some of them verses that have helped me in the past, but it just feels like there's nothing there. Right? I know it's still true. I know it helped me then. I know it can help me now. You try and do what David did, where he encouraged himself in the Lord, and you sit there and you start trying to count your blessings, and it's not helping. And then you feel guilty that you're not jumping for joy because of all that God's blessed you with. Right? You're saying, but, but Jordan, how, how do you... How do you deal with that? You quit like a man. The remedy first is found here. You know what I think of the person that I think of when I read quit you like men? I think of Uriah. Uriah the Hittite. Uriah is the one that, go and study it out, he's the best of the best of the best. He swore his very life to David, not because he was a great man, but because he was God's man. He said, I will die. My life is in your hands because I know you're God's man. And because David desired his wife, David told everybody else, when you go out to battle, pull back and leave Uriah out there by himself. You want to talk about being low. Uriah was a seasoned man in battle. He knew what was happening. But there was something deep down inside of him that said, those are God's enemies and I can't back up. I swore that I would fight those people to keep them from getting to God's man. And the Bible says that he fought so long and held on to his sword so hard that his hand clave unto the sword. You know what that means? That means he was holding so hard all the muscles in his arms and his hands started cramping. So badly to the point that he couldn't let go of the sword if he wanted to. When you get to them points where it feels like nothing's putting fuel in your gas tank, that you're going through it and you don't know why, you don't know how it happened, you don't know what in the world you even feel at the moment. That's why I'm thankful I'm not saved on emotion. Right? There are days that I don't feel saved. But I do know that if you hold on to this, when you run out of strength, the sword will hold on to your hand. The key is that you don't let go. You quit like a man. But, but Brother Jordan, it's, just, it's hard to get in. I know. It's hard to even motivate yourself to brush your teeth in the morning, let alone to sit down and say, Lord, I've been trying and I'm getting nothing. I'll remind you, David prayed for 21 days. No answer. Right? Or Daniel, sorry. David came back to Ziklag and everybody is gone. People were thinking about stoning him. And he had to go encourage himself in the Lord. There's an epoch there. That's space of time. I don't know how long it took. I know it was short because God said, well, I mean, it wasn't too long because God said, go and get them. They hadn't even made it back to their camp yet. They still marching with all the families of David and his men, but also with all the spoils. Everything that God had blessed them with. And there are days you feel like the enemy robbed you, not just of what God is, you know, trying to do in your life. It feels like it's robbed all the blessings out of your life. 
And some of them couldn't bear it. They just fought a battle. They just come from a victory. Some of them was wounded. Some of them was already hurt. And when the wind got sucked out of their sail, what did they do? I've already mentioned it. They stuck by the stuff. Right? They didn't just walk off and abandon. They said, no, 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 no. We're going to stick by the stuff that we know works. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? Are you saying just hang in there? That everything will be okay? No, I'm saying keep doing what you know works. Why do you think the Bible says His Word shall not return void? Right? Why do you think Brother Greg so many times has told us when you can't see God's hand, you can trust His heart? You may not be able to trace Him. You may not be able to point out and say, that's what God's doing, but you know that everything that He does is for our betterment. It's to strengthen us. It may be a test. It may be a trial. It may be you being put on display for others to show that you really are serious about what you've professed for so many years or for a short time. It may be God's putting you on display to say, hey, the road between Philippi and Corinth wasn't easy, but Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaicus, when it got hard, they just kept on going. And as a result, all the people in Corinth were helped. You realize that they wouldn't have read this passage about them three fellas if them three fellas gave up halfway down the road? Well, said, it may be a hard storm. It may be a one that caught you off guard. But the last thing you need to do in the middle of the storm is lose the map. The last thing you need to do is to cut out all the light. It's a lamp into our feet, light into our path. last thing you need to do when you don't know where to go is to lose the words of the one that already knows how it's going to end out. So you say, well, Brother Jordan, there's danger in these verses. Watch. Yeah, things are going to creep up on you. They're going to take you by surprise. But if you're always watching, you may not be ready for it because it may be something you've never faced before. But you'll always be equipped with what you need. It does work. I can testify to that for you. Right? But then, also I want you to notice that he says, Watch ye stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men. Be strong. Let all things be done in, with charity. You ever get to them points where you're hollowed out? You're singing the songs that used to. You'd get them goosebumps all over. And now it's just sounds coming out of a radio. You get to them points and you go back and listen to some of them hallmark messages that our pastor or some of the preachers that have come through here and it just seems like it doesn't have the power that it once used to have. What's it say? Be strong and let everything be done with charity. If you're like me, which I get I'm weird. I'm not like most people. Understand. But if you're like me, when all you're trying to do is make sense of what's going on, you become very irritable. You become very snappy. Very uncompassionate. Right? Because inwardly, you're in pain, and you're just trying to make it through the end of the day. Right? What was said about Stephanus and his house? That they were addicted to the things of God. The danger... And when your life gets turned upside down, is that those things that were staples in your life, in fact, one of the symptoms of depression that I've often had to deal with, is that the things that I used to like, I really don't have a craving for them no more. Right? I'll shut things off. I'll just avoid the, the things that I used to use all the time, I don't use them no more. Right? The things that used to mean something to me, they've lost their savor, so to speak. I find no enjoyment in them anymore. The danger when you don't know which way's up and you're hanging on by the last thread that you've got is that you give up those things that once defined you as a Christian. The danger is that your appetite is no longer addicted to God. You're just looking for anything to stop the pain. Right? That you've gone through so much that you're just saying, Lord, 
I don't care if it's spiritual morphine, just numb me up. Right, so you're searching. You're Googling. You're YouTubing. You're going back through all the notes and the margins of your Bible. And what's the danger? That, well, no, that wasn't it, that wasn't it, that wasn't it, that wasn't it. So I guess none of them are it. No, press through. Right? I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I ran through the hard to get to the finish. The danger is that instead of becoming or staying addicted to the things of God, when you get up and you sing and other people get blessed by what you're singing, but it didn't do nothing for you, that's a hard place to be in. Right? When you're teaching and you know that what you're teaching is true, or when you're explaining a Bible verse to somebody else, and it seems like their face lights up because a light bulb went on, but that light bulb that used to be on in your head's dark now, and nothing's turning it back on. Right? What is that? It's a place of hardness. But hardness does not overcome the hand of God. We don't do because we delight in the things of God. If that were the case, everybody gets saved because doing the things that God said would be fun. And they're enjoyable. Are they? A lot of them, yeah. But living a separated life, that's not always fun. Living a life of standards, not always fun. Right? Living a life that on the days you feel like giving up, you don't give up because you don't want to become cast away, as the Apostle Paul wrote. On the days that you're just hanging on because you know, thus saith the Lord. You're not doing it for delight. You're not doing it because it makes you feel good. You're just doing it because you know it's right and there's something way down in here that's telling you to just keep going. The danger is, hey, sometimes it gets slapped nuts around here. Right? Next thing you know, people taking laps. Right? If we had chandeliers, there'd be people hanging from them. Right? But not always like that. And there are times that you'll be driving down the road and it feels like God's sitting in your lap and you're ready to kick the windows out. And in other days it feels like you're driving down the road and God's not within 100 miles of you. And you're just struggling to get back to the house just to crawl back into bed because you've been exhausted just on trying to do the basic things. What's the answer? Well, the answer is never giving up on the things that you were addicted to. Why were these men addicted to them? because of their love for God there's one thing that the world can't steal from you it is your love you may give your joy away they can't steal it but you may give your joy away you may give your peace away you may give away all the comforts that God had blessed you with or God may take them away so that in a spirit or in a time of hardness you can form more to the image of his son We mentioned it in Sunday school this morning. He said, take up my cross, thy cross, follow me. Right? Continue on. That cross is heavy. That cross is not pleasant. Jesus wasn't skipping up the Via Della Rosa toward Mount Calvary. He was beaten and broken, but he did it in order to become the perfect sacrifice for our sin. In order to conform to the image of Christ, I must become a partaker in the sufferings and afflictions of Christ. I must, not because of the delight, not because it makes me feel all warm and fuzzy on the inside, but because I love Him, I endure the hardness. I'm addicted to His Word because it came from Him. He left it for me because He loved me. I don't do so that somebody will give me a pat on the back. But every now and then somebody comes by and I want to give them a pat on the back because they had just what I needed just when I needed it. Because God equipped them and sent them by my way. And I want to tell them and stop, just like our verses said. Right? Therefore acknowledge ye, ye them that are such. You were just a blessing from God right at the right time. Because on the other side... They may have been used to be a blessing to you, but they've been going through hardness. I got a stack of cards, very special place. In fact, they're in a fireproof safe. So that hopefully, God forbid, anytime there's ever a fire, they might survive. And those cards are from people 
That just write me a little note. It says, thanks for what you do for the Lord. Right? That's when you grow weary in well-doing. God giving you an opportunity to go back and remind that what you do does mean something. I'm addicted to it because I love Him. And when all I've got left is the love that I have for God, His love might shine out and say, remember all those times that I used you to help people? Remember all those times that you didn't realize why you were saying this or why you brought this up or why that verse came to your mind and you said it to that person just a few weeks or a few months down the road get a card in the mail and say hey you don't know what that meant to me you're right I don't but I'm glad that I'm a vessel that God can use for his honor and his glory I said it this morning during the invitation a hammer just knows how to be a hammer and some days it's tough being a hammer right you're getting whacked up against things all day but a hammer can be hung up on the wall at the end of the night and know, I was a good hammer today. I did what God wanted me to do. Wasn't easy. May have been hot, may be covered in tar up on the roof, right? May be cold, and you've got ice and sludge and everything else all caked onto you. But God can hang you back up in the tool shed and say, that hammer survived the element. It survived the test. Because you know how you find out if something's worth something or not? You've got to use it you got to test it. Doesn't do you any good if you think the tool might get the job done until you try to get the job done with the tool. And God knows whether or not we're going to make it because He'll never let us be tempted above what we're able. Right? He'll never let the world overcome us just for our destruction. He always equips us beforehand and then it's up to us to apply what He's given to us. But if we do it out of love, even though it's hard, even though you don't know how you're still going, you're just running on hope. right? But when you get to that point, when you overcome, it shows the rest of the world you didn't need everything that they thought was keeping you in the race. All you needed was Him. That's easy to say, real hard to live. Those nights when you're sitting there and you're saying, Lord, I don't even remember what I did today. I was an autopilot the whole time. Right? I know I talked to some people on the phone. I know I mailed some things. Right? I know that I spoke to some people at the office. But Lord, really, what did I accomplish all day long? It's all you can do just to keep putting one foot in front of the other. Right? But, because you keep putting one foot in front of the other, you may be an encouragement to somebody else. You may be an example unto somebody else doesn't say here that Stephanus had the best life in fact Corinth and Acacia very notorious historically very notorious historically that it was a very wicked and vile place that they weren't just heathens they were the most heathen of the heathens right they were the ones that you know if you didn't believe what they believed just like the Jews did with Christ they'd make an example out of you but through it all, Stephanus and his whole house stayed addicted to the things of God because they satisfied. You want to know why the things of God satisfy? Because when you do it just out of the love of God, what was it that God desired of Adam and Eve? That they just loved Him. What's the great commandment? That we love Him with everything that we are. What's the second? That we love our neighbor as ourselves. When we do because we love, it always satisfies. When you do something out of love for somebody that you love, nobody can rob you of the experience. It doesn't matter if you did anything. For it. You could have gone out, taken a piece of paper, folded it in half, glued a leaf on the front of it, and wrote them a sappy you know, love letter on the inside of that piece of paper. But it means the world to them, and nobody can rob you of the joy that you got in giving it to them. Not because it was something, pre but because you did it out of love. Or when the kid comes home from school, and they say, this is a picture I drew you of something, and it don't look like something, but it means the world to you, and they love giving it to you because it was done out of love. Right? God may look at our attempts and say, that's a mess, but I can use that mess for my honor and glory. That's why it satisfies. Stephanus was just satisfied. 
Too often as Christians, we're guilty of looking at results. Jeremiah had that problem. Elijah had that problem. And all of them got to the point that they're saying, Lord, just kill me. What's the point going on? Jeremiah had preached for decades. Not one person had stopped and taken to heart what he said. Elijah just stood there and said, All right, Lord, do what you said you was going to do. I followed all the instructions. Fire came down from heaven. They got rid of all the prophets of Baal and the prophets of the grove. And then the queen, after seeing the manifest power of God, still wanted to kill him and turn the people's hearts away from God that they had just prior said, The Lord, He is the God. The Lord, He is the God. There are days you're doing everything right and it don't feel like it's going right. And you're saying, Lord, what's the point? Why? Because I was looking over here instead of looking up there. I do it because I love them. The trials that test your love for the things of God are the hardest, but they're also the ones that are most important. Because if you fail those, you'll find yourself out of the things of God because you gave up on those things that you used to love. Why are we going over there? Because God wants to do something around here. So what do you think the devil's going to try and do? He could take your joy. He could take your peace. He could take the comforts that God's given you. But as long as you hang on to that love for the things of God, and it's the supreme love in your life, you'll overcome it. And you'll prove him a liar. Because all he wants to do is stand before the throne of God and say, yep, you took everything away from so-and-so. And they gave up on you. And God's just standing there saying, nope, because they love me, they keep on going. Because of what I did for them, they appreciate it so much that they're willing to just do the little that I ask of them. And on the other side, you may be like Job where you get double. It may be where you just get back what you had. Or it may be that God gives you something different entirely. But whatever it is, it'll be satisfying. And the sourest taste in the world is knowing that God wanted to do something, but you gave up. The worst taste that you'll ever have in your mouth is when you have to eat that crow because you say, Lord, I messed up and I didn't see what you was trying to do. I don't have to see. I just got to follow. I don't have to understand. I just have to obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way. But finally, I want you to notice the perfection of the church is that God gave us other people. Notice in verse number 16, that ye submit yourselves unto such who? Those like Stephanas are just addicted and sold out to God. Submit means sit back, watch them, learn from them for a little bit. Because they were sent by the Apostle Paul to instruct this church in the things that the Apostle Paul had instructed them in. He's saying, they may be a little wild, they may be a little crazy, you may think they're unhinged, but just submit, sit down, listen what they got to say, and you'll understand real quick that they've got what you need. Right? The Bible does say not to confess our sins one to another, but our faults unto one another. Right? I don't know. How many people noticed? But uh, last Sunday morning, Sunday school, in pain. I taught Sunday school on one leg because I had nerve pain down one of my legs. How'd that happen? Probably from helping my brother move a desk that was too big to fit through a doorway up some steps and then trying to fit it through that doorway. I, I don't know that, but that's my suspicion. Point is, it's rough. Right? But why did I do didn't do it so that people don't. But Brother Brian noticed. He said, you're back all right? Not really. He said, I could tell. What's that? That's somebody that noticed and then said, hey, I'm going to make sure that that person's okay. Right? I didn't get up here and tell y'all. I didn't get up and say, oh, well, pray for me. My back's done. I've taught with 104 fever before. Y'all didn't know that because I came in late and didn't shake nobody's hand. And then I went back to the office back there, drenched in sweat. And I had to go home and go to sleep because I was exhausted. But I've done it. So a little bit of back pain, I was good. Did it out of love. But just because you're hanging on to love doesn't mean that God doesn't want to send somebody by your way to help. 
But Bob was another one night. He asked me, your back feeling better? Yep. You had 100%? I don't know. I don't remember what 100% is. I've had back problems since high school. I slipped a disc back then and whoo. There now and then. Sciatica. But like the Apostle Paul, his grace is sufficient. But sometimes his grace takes form in church members. Right? Find you somebody that you look at them and you say, they're addicted to the things of God. And when you've got a moment in your life where all you're holding on to is the very last thing, just go to them and say, hey, brother, hey, sister, can I confide in you in confidence? Can you pray for me? I don't know what I'm going through. I don't know why I'm going through it, but I'm going through a rough one. I don't know if you've ever had them, but if you have, then you understand. I can't explain it, but if you've been there, you know what it feels like. What did Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaicus, what did they do? For that which was lacking on your part, they have supplied. When somebody's in so much pain, they don't have the words when they get down to pray. That their life is turned topsy-turvy. And when they get down to pray, they know they're supposed to be thanking God for what He's done that day, but they can't remember what went on that day. That's when the Holy Spirit will make groanings and utterings and take those to the throne of God. I'm thankful for that, but every now and then, there is such a thing as supplication and intercessory prayer. That somebody else says, Lord, I don't know what they're going through. That's between you and them. But I just want to lift them up out of charity. I want to see them come through it, get over it, and you continue to use them. Somebody that's addicted that may just call and check up on you and say, hey, how you doing? Right? Because knowing that somebody is out there that does care can help you get through it. The Apostle Paul couldn't make it to these, uh, these church members, but he sent these boys. And he said, if you got a problem, they can supply it. He says, they've already supplied things y'all don't even know about yet. But when you had need, they filled it. Right? It may just be going out, sitting down, and having a cup of coffee, letting somebody unload onto somebody else that may understand it or may not understand it. And you may be able to just sit back and say, I have no idea what you're going through, but I do know this. God does, and I also know that I can pray for you. I may not be able to understand what load I'm lifting, but I can try and help and lift it. Or on those days where you've just been really through it and you can't encourage yourself in the Lord, you may need to go to somebody else that's addicted to the things of God and say, yeah, when I was low, this is what helped me. It may help you. Because when recalling the things that God's done for you, when those have lost their savor, maybe you need to hear it from somebody else. That, hey, he could still do it because he did it for me. And you say, Brother Jordan, that's not very spiritual. Yeah, well, we don't have halos. Right, you can sit there and count your blessings all day long, but if you're numb on the inside, if you have no joy, no pleasure, and you're just doing because you know it's the right thing to do, you may need to get some good news from a far country. You may need somebody to say, hey, come to a desert place for a while and rest for a little bit. You may need somebody to come by your way, or maybe you need to be the person that goes by somebody else's way. You know why I keep them cards? Because they're good news from a far country. You know why I've got a desk back there full of things that people have given me that are Star Wars? I don't take them home, I leave them here. i got a little shrine back there. Some of the stuff is stuff that I brought. Other stuff is stuff that people brought me. But you know why I do that? Those are little gifts of charity. To show that somebody did it, not because they think I'm special, but because they said, God used you to do something. And because of that, I appreciate you. It's not what I did. But because out of love, I just tried to do something for him. He took it and did something else. Those may be the last few bits of thread that I've got left to hang on to on the days that I'm really hurting, on the days when I'm really down, on the days that the doctors have tried changing this and changing that, and none of it's helping. But I feel like there's just a hump that I need to you know, cycle over, but the bike ain't going nowhere. 
And what I thought was going to be a speed bump in, you know, turned into Kilimanjaro. Right? But as Sister Brittany sang at this point, God already sees me on top of the mountain. I've just got to trust that because He loves me more than I know what love is, He'll, ta- he'll carry me through. Mary and Martha mourned for Lazarus when he died. There was the pain. There was the separation. There was the loneliness, but he was restored. They got it all back. And one of them has the testimony that because she appreciated so much that what God did, you can still get a whiff of that, you know, box of myrrh, that sweet-smelling odor that was given unto God. You can still get a hint of that today. You go over there and start reading that, how she dried his feet with her hair, and then it'll start smelling a little bit different around your house. But what if the example that God wants to use you to make is going to make a great scent, not just in your life, but in the lives of others around you, to say, those that love Him supremely. She bought it for Christ, by the way, that alabaster box. The Bible says that she bought it against the day of His death. She said, out of honor and respect, I want to make sure that when he goes, he goes out as a king. But she said, I love him so much, I just can't wait to give it to him. And as a result, it's memorialized, not just here. This is forever settled in heaven. There's a copy of this somewhere in glory. I personally believe it's you know somewhere in front of the throne, throne of God. And every now and then, Maybe they just start reading it in heaven. And then there's Mary. Why? She didn't want attention. She didn't want anybody to notice. She just wanted to show Jesus how much she loved him. Still, she had that pain from when her brother was gone, but he's back. And out of appreciation, it may be the pain that you're going through right now is what you need to experience in order to appreciate what God is trying to do. Great pain, when it's taken away, brings the most pleasure. When you've endured the hardest thing that you've ever endured, and God brings you through it, that's one of the things that you call a landmark situation. You can go back and say, I never thought it'd get harder than that, but He bought me through that. And this may be harder than that, but He's going to bring me through this. I mean, how many times do we have to hear the analogy that Dad used on them big old cruise ships when the boat's too big to just go sailing on into the port? They send a little tiny old tugboat out, and they drop the anchor in the tugboat. And the tugboat takes that anchor all the way back into dock. And then the boat that's out there, after the tugboat drops it down into the port, just starts reeling itself in towards the anchor. Well, I've got an anchor within the veil in heaven. He's already there waiting on us. And I may be on the boat, and he may be reeling me in with the anchor. He may be pulling me close to home, but that doesn't mean that the storms are going to be smooth the entire time. Doesn't mean that the waves aren't going to be choppy. Doesn't mean there's going to be a nice little steady breeze at my back. Now, I may go through a few Eurachlodons. I may have a few times, all I want to do is make a campfire, Stupid snake comes out of the campfire, bites me on the arm. I'm sure that wasn't an enjoyable experience. I'll never find out because God gave us the invention of handguns and I'm shooting anything that slithers. Now, that's just me. God put enmity between man's seed and the serpent. I, you say it's a phobia, it's Bible. Anyway. There may be days that you get snake bit but if getting bit's what causes you to get out, doesn't matter how much you loved him, because your love wasn't enough to keep you in. Why do you think Jesus said, if any man loves father or daughter, father, or mother, son, or daughter more than me, not worthy of me, because he loved you more than anything. His love kept him on the cross when he called it called legions of angels. So when I think I'm having a bad day. I don't know what those 40 days in the wilderness where he fasted were like. I don't know what it's like to have Satan himself come and tempt you thrice. But I do know he overcame it so he can overcome it for me. I don't know what it's like 
to 14 days not have anything in the sky to know whether it's morning, afternoon, nighttime, where I'm headed, or which direction the wind's taking us. But the Apostle Paul did. And he said, while he was on the boat, angel of the Lord stood by him, told him everything going to be okay. Never been in a storm like that. So if he could bring Paul through it, I know I can be brought. I've never been thrown into a den of hungry lions. I've never been thrown into a fiery furnace. But if I am, I believe that the fourth man is going to be waiting on me. I may not be able to see him until I get in the fire, but when he reveals himself, as okay, it all makes sense now. Thank you, Lord, for showing up. But I don't know what it's like to hide under some you know, crops that have been harvested from the field on top of a harlot's house in foreign territory trying to scout out what God said he was going to you know give unto us I don't know what that's like to be in fear where if if the, if I sneeze if I breathe the wrong if I cough they're going to find me but yet God took care of it don't know what it's like to have the king show up and say hey I want to buy your threshing floor cuz I'm going to build the greatest Edwam, his son, is going to build the greatest edifice ever resurrected unto God. Solomon's temple. I don't know what it's like to have that requirement. I don't know what it's like to say, here, take it all. I don't know how I'm going to eat tomorrow because I just gave you it all. I can honestly say I've never had to wonder where my next meal was going to come from. But that man did but because of his willingness to do it, David said, uh-uh, you're going to get the best price. Because you gave unto God unreserved. Those that love God. They may be poor in spirit, but blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall inherit the earth. They may be battered and beaten, but he's got the balm of Gilead. And you may not get the balm until after the storm's over. But it'll be worth it once you get through it. Now the danger, I'll say this, I'll be done. The danger is that once you get through one, does that mean there's never going to be another one? No. But if it's God's will, He'll bring you through it. The danger is that like many soldiers nowadays, and then they've traced it all the way back to Vietnam, anything really after World War II, because used to it took you three months on a boat to get somewhere and in three months to get back. And you could process what all you had been through, and you can kind of reaccustom yourself to normal life on the boat. But that hasn't happened in a long time, because now it's airplanes, boats travel faster than they ever have, and you're there on the battlefield, and then two days later you're home. And those soldiers, they say that a car engine starting up, if it just sputters the wrong way, sounds like machine fire, they're right back in it in their mind the danger is that once you come through it you got to leave it behind you yeah I can go back and remember it but it doesn't have a hold on me anymore tell me the apostle Paul never had a bad day read about his life but the bad days never had him the bad months never had him the years that he spent as a prisoner never had him Right? Forgetting those things which are behind, I press toward the mark of the high calling of Jesus. I press towards the thing that he set before me that is so much better than what's behind me. Well, what's in front of me? Him. The one that loved me supremely. That's why we should, like a flint, face him. You know what that means? Nothing's going to turn you aside. Quit you like men. That means you quit when Jesus says, job's done. When's that going to be? When we get to glory. Well, that's a long job. Well, maybe not. Soon and very soon, he could be coming. But I don't want to be guilty of right at the time where, it was most, where things are winding down, where we're in the last of the last of the last days, and he's about ready to take the church. I don't want to be an example of one that gave in right when people needed an example the most. How do you do it? 
or my flesh will fail you. But I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. I am weak. I'm dumb. I'm impulsive. But he is altogether lovely. There's no fault in him. And every now and then you may just get a taste, but if you get a taste, you'll taste and see that the Lord is good. And as high as it got around here in these meetings, that may have been the taste that's going to get you through the hardness. But when you get through, there will be another taste. You may go a while between it getting as high as it did and the next time it does, but He gives you the mountaintop experience to get you through the valley to the next mountain. You grow in the valley, but He uses the mountain to propel you through the valley. If we hesitantly start climbing down the mountain on the other side, say, well, Lord, I'd really like to stay up here on the mountain. When you get down to the bottom, you got no momentum. But if you take off running saying, all right, Lord, let's get through this valley so we can get to the next mountain, you build up a full head of steam on the way down the mountain. When that storm comes into your life, you may just hit the ground running and it'll get over a whole lot sooner. Because instead of suffering and wondering why you're suffering, you just get fed up with suffering and say, let's just get it over with. Let's get through this. He's still God. What, we receive blessings of the hand of God and not cursing? He's God. So Job said, Lord give it, you take it away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Not dependent on my situation. And as somebody that lived it, your situation looks a whole lot bigger when all your attention's on you. You step back and get a little bit of perspective, you'll realize, nah, God's got this too. But I've never faced this before. He has. Tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. That song that Brother James sings, I failed, but he passed. And the good thing is, I'm robed in his righteousness. I get to take his report card, not mine. If I'll allow him to live through. If you enjoyed today's message, head on over to ibcforums.com and click on sermons. And don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.